We are starting the, the, the session, the final uh, panel, uh, which is going to be on governance, which in many respects is um, um, uh, bringing together all of, you know, so many of the issues. Uh, and I think that we pick up from what um, uh, Ayanda said. I mean, I thought that he was just so wonderful in uh, highlighting and articulating, you know, the big picture issues. and. You know, he sort of says, well, you know, once we re you recognize the technology is neutral, of course you have to go to this, what he calls a higher level, higher order problems. And uh, the way I sort of put it more simply is that if there are problems with technology and it's widening inequality, you know, is this a, do you look for a technological gap or do you look for a social, uh, social political, economic solution? Uh, and uh, the, the, the solution lies in institutions. And so this is what the focus of this panel is. And we have a great lineup of speakers. Um, 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 we have Peter Asaro, who has been working on issues of governing uh, AI for many, uh, for many years. He's, uh, we're very proud that he's here uh, right at the new school in another program in media studies. Um, we have Elizabeth, who is um, at AI Now, a very exciting um, center at NYU. Um, we have um, um, Padmasri uh, Gail Sampath from uh, Harvard University, um, Klein Beekman Center. I, I keep on, um, I'm not sure that I got that totally right. Um, and, um, and Christiane. Van Veen, who works uh, very closely with um, Philip Alston um, and is uh, organizing this, uh, directing this program on the digital welfare state at um, NYU. And finally, we have uh, Jomo, who will be a discussant. So this is a very crowded panel, and so I have had to ask uh, everyone to be very short in their initial remarks, particularly because I hope that this is something that will elicit a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, lot of conversation. So, Peter, and I'm just gonna we just gonna have to play musical chairs. All right, thank you. So I have the uh, the enviable task of explaining how to govern all of artificial intelligence in 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, so I'm just going to try to give a kind of conceptual overview of a framework of how I think this can work, and then some of the specific challenges around. AI machine learning and why it's difficult to regulate and how that might play out uh, in healthcare uh, in particular. Um, so we've seen this flurry of AI ethics principles coming out of both governments and private sector uh, over really the last year or two. Um, and I mostly work on military AI, autonomous weapons, um, trying to get a treaty at the UN to ban autonomous weapons. Uh, or killer robots. Um, and so as part of that work, I did a review of 28 private sector ethics principles for the UN Institute for Disarmament Research this year. Um, ooh, mind numbing. Uh, they're very redundant. Uh, they're very high level. They all say we should incorporate fairness, transparency, accountability, these sorts of things. Uh, but they're very short on substance for the most part. Uh, an interesting exception is Google. Uh, which included statements about weapons and about military applications because there was a large-scale protest of workers at Google over Project Maven, uh, which I sort of helped support with a, a letter from academics and The Guardian. Um, but uh, apart from that, there's not a lot of specifics about life and death. Interestingly, though, um, the American Medical Association actually had one of the more rigorous sets of AI ethics principles. Uh, looking at how it could be incorporated into healthcare, and I would recommend taking a look at that if you get a chance. But there's also been wide scale uh, criticism of these principles as a form of ethics washing uh, and attempts to avert or, or avoid regulation. Um, and I think that's problematic, and I think we do need regulation. Uh, there's only a few exceptions in, in, the, in the private sector. We've seen the Microsoft CEO, Brad Smith, calling for federal regulation of face recognition technology and also for international cooperation around a, what he calls a digital Geneva Convention, 
that could cover all sorts of things around data. I think these are great ideas. We'll see if other companies step up uh, and participate in these kinds of processes. Uh, but clearly there's going to be a regulation happening at different levels, local level, national level, international level. What that means varies. We've seen with small UAV drones in the US, lots of local regulation popping up in the void of the FAA not promulgating its regulations, it finally did. There's still this kind of crazy patchwork of regulation, nobody knows where you can fly or not or who has authority. Um, so hopefully we don't get that around healthcare. <laughs> Uh, at the national level, of course, this is where most healthcare regulation happens right now in the world. And so you have the FDA in the United States, but also because a lot of these products are commercial products, you have the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and you have this system that we heard just a bit about, which is actually the lit litigation system. So liability and tort law and the ability to sue for malpractice and class action and all of that actually serves a huge regulatory function. Uh, within the system. And so I think we'll, we'll continue to see these sorts of things, but again, as we see applications come out, different kinds of agencies will be regulating different aspects. There's been talk about having like a federal robotics commission or of some kind of agency to regulate artificial intelligence. It's not really clear what that would look like or how that would work because it operates in so many different industries and areas. Uh, at a global level, we face sort of similar challenges. Uh, we have standards uh, sort of promulgated at an international level, so the IEEE uh, we heard from yesterday has been issuing lots of standards, the International Standards Organization, things like that. Uh, there's been this UN high-level panel on digital cooperation, the World Health Organization is working on the sets of kind of ethics of AI in healthcare. Uh, and we have certain models out there for international regulation around technology. Kind of the big one is ICANN which regulates the internet, which is mostly just IP addresses and the basic protocols for assigning those. Um, it's an interesting situation because it's able to actually, because of the way the infrastructure works, it can maintain authority regardless of national interests. Um, there's people who love it, people who hate it, um, but it's a definitely an interesting model. Uh, and my own work, we've been organizing what we're calling an international congress for the regulation of artificial intelligence. Uh, we're trying to get, make that a multi-stakeholder with academics, industry, governments of uh, various sorts. Uh, we'll be having our first congress meeting in April in the Prague. Hopefully some of you can make it uh, and talk about the healthcare issues there. Um, but the way I sort of see it going forward is in terms of regulation, there's kind of three categories. There's the stuff we want to ban, there's the stuff we want to regulate, and there's the stuff we want to set free, right? And the stuff we want to ban mostly comes from human rights and human dignity and that we know we shouldn't do that. So for me, the autonomous weapons issue is one of these that clearly violates human rights, human dignity. We should just ban them. There are certainly forms of autonomy that will operate in the military, applications of AI and things like that. We need to figure out how to regulate that. Um, and then there's all sorts of applications for, say, transportation and things like that, that from a military perspective we should set free, uh, let innovation happen, decide later what we want to do about it once we have that kind of innovation. Um, but the hard part, of course, is the middle bit, the regulation. How do we devise regulation? Who's, who's party to that? Um, what principles do we follow? Um, and so now I kind of want to step back and say, okay, let's regulate AI. What do we regulate? What is AI? Uh, and I think there's kind of three categories here as well. So you have algorithms, you have data, and you have applications or uses of the technology. So each of these offers its own kinds of challenges in terms of regulation. Uh, algorithms, as I said yesterday, it's just math. How do we start regulating math? Uh, should we regulate math? Uh, there's actually some precedents for this, particularly export controls around encryption technology, um, which in the long run are ineffective because the technology eventually distributes, but it is effective at restricting distribution for periods of time. It's also something that's very easily definable. Oh, we have 128-bit encryption or we have 256-bit encryption and we can make a law that says you can't export that and we catch you and we fine you. How do you do that for more complex kinds of algorithms is more challenging. And of course, the math varies. Um, over the history of AI, they've used lots of different math. 
So the first healthcare uh, expert systems like Mycin in the early 70s for the diagnosis of blood disease, it's basically a logic system based on LISP. Today, everybody's super excited about deep learning, machine learning, and the reason for that is you don't need tons of experts in medicine and all sorts of things working on these out complex algorithms. You just take a big set of data and a big neural network and you crunch the numbers and it gives you some interesting results. Interesting. Um, again, we don't know so clearly what the principles it's operating on are. It's essentially a statistical model. It's a consolidation of all of that data. It's really just a dense data model um, that can then be used for prediction. Okay. So it's really simple rules. So how are you going to regulate the rules? There's, uh, it's just a big network uh, following these rules. It gets better and better. You have the actual models themselves once you've trained it, and that's actually a representation of the data. So there's questions about regulating data, and does that relate to the neural network that you have? Oh, my gosh, five minutes. Um, right, so the other thing is they find correlation, not causation. Generally in medical science, we care about the latter. There's all sorts of spurious correlations. Um, and these systems don't care about that at all. Uh, and also because of that, there's a technique called generative adversarial neural networks where you train one network, then you train another network how to fool the first network. And there are mathematically sort of countably, you know, infinite sorts of ways to defeat the first one. This is a big deal in the military because you can uh, defeat all kinds of recognition systems this way. But in medicine, you could say, find the variable that most doctors aren't going to notice that you could just change and you're going to get a bunch of free you know, opioid prescriptions or something like that and kind of filter through the system. And there are these ways to sort of deceive these systems. Uh, the other one that's big that we kind of concept to hold on to is the idea of a proxy variable. And there was a bit of discussion yesterday about this analysis of the healthcare system in the U.S. that was... Uh, differentially offering care to African Americans and whites, and it was using as a proxy for health outcomes uh, the amount of money the insurance company was spending on patients, and of course they were spending much less on African American patients, and so they were then predicting or suggesting to provide less care to those people, thus kind of reinforcing in it. But what they're doing is using a, a proxy variable of the cost of health care to represent the value of healthcare, and that's not the same thing. Um, you also get proxies that are unintended, because the system can learn proxies on its own. So if we say there's a set of categories like race or gender that we want to blind our AI to, and we actually erase them from the data set, they're very successful at reconstructing those variables. So we don't say that you're an African American, but that your name, the neighborhood you live in, the schools you went to, all sorts of things about you will re-indicate that to the system and can be used as a proxy variable by the system to make further decisions. And we have no idea how to actually eliminate that process. Um, right, so data, how do, we rep how do we regulate data? We talked about privacy, the challenges around that. That's where most of the discussion has been. But again, there's all these deeper questions within AI about representation and bias. We've seen already in pharmaceuticals, lots of testing of pharmaceuticals happens in underprivileged communities. It can also happen across international borders. The input then to the system is coming from diverse populations being used to sort of inform applications in a different population. So you have a question if you're a minority or a subpopulation, is the data representative of you? Is the healthcare that it's suggesting for you actually applicable to you? Do you want more representation there? Do we want the system segregating populations into different groups based on what it thinks is important? And how does that play out also when we translate systems from one group or one area to another part of the world? These are huge questions and problems going forward. Finally, we have questions about use and application. We can just look at medical robots and the ISO standards around those fall into three different categories. They can be industrial safety concerns. There's a whole category for personal care robotic applications. There's a whole different set for medical instruments applications. Uh, in June, the FDA here in the U.S. issued uh, a guidance paper for suggestions on 
treating AI and machine learning as a medical device. And I think that's probably makes sense for diagnostics, testing, things like that. It's going to be counting as a medical device. Uh, probably also for care, intervention, and monitoring. And this is where the data is very tightly coupled to health outcomes. And we can probably actually do this kind of analysis. Um, when we get to these questions of public health, which is really what we heard in the last uh, panel, looking at environmental variables, behavioral variables, uh, you know, systems are going to tell us obvious things like poverty is bad for your health. All right, but what do we do about that, right? Um, and then we get into questions of epidemiology, preventative care, how are we actually allocating resources? We have this third category again, care delivery, and how are we optimizing that? And how are we talking about equality there, efficiency, the distribution of resources, who's involved in all of that? And I think these kind of personal care, public health, uh, and then the kind of systemic care delivery system are all questions where uh, inequality are going to come up, where regulation is needed, but it's going to be difficult and complex to figure out how to do it, and it's going to be very different in different healthcare systems. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I mean, it's very, very concrete and so it helps us root ourselves. Okay, the next speaker is Liz Kaziunas. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Liz Kazunis, and I research the social implications of health datification at AI Now, including the growing uses of personal health data in machine learning and AI technologies. So I was asked today to speak a bit about the AI Now report, which we release at the end of each year. So, so I, this one is from 2018, and this comes at a moment we're actively trying to um, write our, our new end of the year report for 2019. Um, and in particular, um, you know, you can go, you can read the report, and there's a lot of issues here um, that are of relevance. But I wanted to focus in on one that discusses, um, I'm sorry, um, facial recognition technology and affect recognition technology. So um, in our report, we have written about this issue, including that facial recognition and affect recognition technology needs strident regulation to protect the public interest. Such regulation should include national laws that require oversight, clear limitations, and public transparency. Communities should have the right to reject the application of these technologies in both public and private contexts. Mere public notice of their use is not sufficient, and there should be a high threshold for any consent given the dangers of oppressive and continual mass surveillance. In particular, we called out affect, rec affect recognition technology as deserving particular attention. Um, this is a particular subclass of facial recognition technology that claims to detect things such as personality, inner feelings, mental health, and worker engagement based off of images of, um, and videos of faces. Now, a lot of these claims are um, problematic um, and they are not supported necessarily um, by science. And so um, this is something that has um, you know, come up a lot in the news and is, of, um, is a great deal of concern to us um, at AI Now. And I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, I'm an, I'm an ethnographer, and I wanted to provide an example of <laughs> thinking about um, AI and especially affect recognition technology as it's emerging um, in a lived um, experience of behavioral health care and kind of ground um, some of these um, governance um, recommendations and bring up the complexities involved with this. So, 
So there's a lot of hope, I think, um, that AI will solve many of the widespread problems that we have in healthcare. Um, but the reality is often more complex. So, um, in cons uh, you know, and especially um, this relates to affect rec recognition technology. There's a whole set of startups and large technology companies that are all racing each other to try to apply AI to these complex behavioral health issues. We heard of some of them earlier this morning, including predicting who might commit suicide before it happens. So this would involve using combinations of wearable sensors and phone apps to track people's cognitive function and moods. And some companies claim to have up to a 60% chance in predicting a day before a person has self-harming thoughts. But at this stage, the reliability of mood prediction and therapeutic usefulness of these automated behavioral health technologies, it's unclear. Again, there's a little sort of peer-reviewed research that's been published. And a lot of groups have released results saying that they have achieved only moderate rather than outstanding um, accuracy when it comes to forecasting moods. So even engineers who are involved in the deployment of some of these systems admit that they are concerned about the technology being misused. In particular, they fear that corporations will target advertising at those whose good or bad moves can be seen coming. And insurance companies, especially here, this is a big issue in the US, will set prices based off of signs of their customers' mental health. And this isn't unrealistic. So Amazon just filed a new patent for an Alexa system that claims to tell you when you're sick because your physical or emotional state is different from your normal pattern of behavior. And of course, the result of detecting that you are unwell or unhappy is to sell you things like cough drops or medications. But how else might this data be used now that Amazon is itself becoming a health insurer and is also gathering health data and using it to sell products? What other unkind un of foreseen biases might emerge in these scenarios? So these privacy concerns regarding access to all this personal health information, it's really important as companies like LexisNexis and Cigna, Cigna, they're already selling algorithms that provide risk scores for people who might be at risk based off of patient claim data. But it's also important to ask how is prediction or automated diagnosis of illness tied to the healthcare services and resources that enable access to care. These tools result in increased surveillance and monitoring without help to address the systemic inequalities in access to care. So again, like this is where I'd like to illustrate sort of the, the real potential social harms and the challenges for regulating affect recognition technology. This is an example I'm drawing from my own research in AI and behavioral health. And I'm using Facebook because it's really a high profile example of companies who are currently using AI to support mental health needs. Since 2015, there have been um, high profile kind of uh, Facebook live suicide broadcasts around the world. And so faced with questions of liability as well as public outrage, Facebook promised to find solutions, including increasing content moderation through hiring additional human workers, but also investing in technical forms of suicide monitoring driven by AI and machine learning technologies. And how does this um, kind of suicide prediction algorithm work? And how and in what ways can we hold it accountable? So some have argued, for example, of creating transparent or explainable AI. But in this sense, you know, um, it really is, we're working in what is called you know, a, a black box. We don't know much about um, this particular algorithm due to the opacity of the machine learning techniques involved, but also the proprietary nature of the Facebook um, algorithms and IP. Facebook, however, has really recently shared some of the details um, in publications and promotional videos, including that they're monitoring text, video, and comments for mood to determine suicide risk and self-harm among all their users globally. Posts are classified according to type, and they're assigned a risk score that triggers different human and machine interventions. So, for example, a post on, you know, me being so sad may generate an automated query of are you okay <laughs> with a chatbot. Um, talking about being so sad may also generate a system response Liz, we're reaching out to offer help. The system can automatically re recommend tips or resources for the user, and this is usually a phone number for a local support group um, in behavioral health. However, some posts are flagged for additional review by community operations, although we don't know how necessarily a lot of these content moderators are trained. 
and if they have behavioral health um, expertise. And this can escalate to a whole series of interventions to local authorities and first responders. Again, this is globally. So Facebook has indicated that as of 2018, at least 100 people and um, thoughts there are many more have been visited by local first responders such as police force. Now, one of the, the really interesting kind of um, uh, reasonings and logics that have come out of this in terms of um, thinking about this space and the critiques involved in, in terms of thinking about how do, we, how do we regulate this is kind of looking at Facebook as um, really entering a space of public health even though they deny that they're acting in this capacity. But they have written about their, Facebook in particular, has written about their efforts um, in terms of creating a safe and global community. So um, in some of their publications, they have written current ethical debates about the consequences of automation generally focus on the rights of individuals. However, algorithmic processes, the major component of automated systems like AI, exhibit a collective dimension first and foremost. As we build a global community, this is a moment of truth. Our success isn't just based on whether we capture videos and share them with friends. It's about whether we're building a community that help keeps us safe, that prevents harm, helps during crises, and rebuilds afterwards. When someone's thinking of suicide or hurting themselves, we've built an infrastructure to give their friends and communities tools that could save their life. So the use of AI, machine learning, and behavioral health that I'm kind of talking us through today, it's really often held up publicly by Facebook and many others as an example of AI or data science for social good. But the concepts of safety, of harm, and of crisis, they're um, bound up and, and I think often very problematically in a very narrow and technical way. So many communities, including ones that I've worked with in my own research in Michigan, we are taught not to call the police, especially um, when a loved one is going through a mental health crisis for fear of police violence, and we've seen tragic examples of this play out in the news quite regularly. So the forms of algorithmic care that we're talking about today, they're still emerging, and so are um, strategies for governance. But I would argue that algorithmic care is bipolitical in ways that trouble our understanding of what safety, risk, and even global health are. It's a form of care concerned not only with the ongoing maintenance of life or the optimization of health, but with the classification of human activity at scale, which is inherently political. And importantly, AI doesn't make space for the messy realities of social life, such as stigma and racism that can make accurate prediction and automated intervention far riskier for some groups than struggling on one's own, even with limited community resources. So, you know, in some ways, perhaps, it's commonplace to observe that AI touches everything from healthcare to finance to education and criminal justice. But what's less commonly observed, but though I think it's come up a lot um, throughout the discussions yesterday and today, which is great, is that these systems are really well researched in terms of their human and social impacts. And that many have serious downsides that are borne most of all by marginal groups. So there's a deep body of social science literature in medical sociology, anthropology, health informatics, science and technology studies, I can go on and on, that are demonstrating um, you know that none of this data is going to be a complete representation of the patient, of the user, of the community, and that AI systems have the potential, again, to amplify the significant health disparities that already exist. So when we're talking about using AI in healthcare, um, we also need to be talking about stigma, about the widespread lack of trust in technology companies and the medical profession, and the limited access to medical resources experienced by so many. And when we talk about governance, we really need to think about who has a seat at the table and who gets to define and have a say of what types of regulation um, are desired and useful. Thank you. for highlighting some of the complexities. Um, now, next we have uh, Padmashree.
Hi, hi. Um, thank you very much. And big data led innovation and uh, uh, time the field work took a life of its own and I started adding more and more questions and you'll see what 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 came out and also another aspect of the work is to look at how we can work with practitioners and policymakers on AI governance in developing countries so um, <coughs> I'm going to uh, divide the kind of uh, firm level uh, uh, AI and big data work that I find in three categories I think it's very important for me to to present some of that in order to have the discussion on governance. So the first category is to look at uh, is the firms that do general AI in low and middle income countries. So uh, one example here, okay, so um, a lot of the firms that I, I'm not going to name them by name because you know the, a lot of the field work is, is confidential. What I'm putting up here is what I'm allowed to put up here. So a lot of the stuff that I'll tell you is what I'm, you know, in, in code without sort of attributing it to anyone, okay? So this is, for instance, a firm called Endra. It's based in Bangalore in India. This is a firm that looks at, for instance, uh, cervical cancer. And what's available on their website is this photo, and it says we have developed uh, an advanced AI-powered cervical cancer detection system, which facilitates early diagnosis, right? Then you have firms like this. So this is another one called Niramai. It's also in India. They've developed a sort of a software with machine intelligence for life enhancement. That's what they call it. And it basically takes x-rays and it sort of tells you what kind of early detection and care you need. It links you to a sort of radiologist that, are, that the firm itself works with. And then these radiologists can give you lifestyle advice. You have similar firms like Kapai uh, AI in India which looks at um, <clears throat> retinal image analysis for glaucoma and so on. A second category of firms, and this is more interesting for the kind of work that, that we are talking about, is big data firms and mega public health platforms and health, okay? And here I'm gonna give you an example of M Pedigree Ghana, which was incubated in Harvard, but is built as a nonprofit organization in Ghana. And the initial goal of this firm was to build actors together to stop the problem of counterfeiting of medicines, which we know is a big problem in developing countries, especially in Africa. So what the firm did was it developed a unique ID for each package to send to a toll-free number, to, and the person who sends it, okay, gets a message, whether it's valid or invalid. Okay, very simple system. But over time, these databases, they started to be collected and they got very sizable for the firm because it was over several African countries and now the firm even exports to other Asian countries. Now, the firm used the same technology in vaccines. They created a liquid crystal system on the packaging where you know cold storage is a big problem. So when the product travels through the cold chain, it changes color and then you know it sort of tells you whether it's traveled through the cold chain in an appropriate manner or not. So in the end, when the nurse gets the package, she can check it and then she can administer the vaccine, okay? Now, what happens here is that images are created throughout and over time, there's the machine learning uh, software that's been created and AI has been trained to track anomalies in this process, okay? Now, this is the cold chain that the firms uh, sort of like invented, okay? So this is how it works. And these are the countries across the world where this cold chain is right now being used. Now, this is sort of like basic information on the firm. It started in 20, 2007. It's gone through several stages. Now the firm has also expanded into agricultural services in African countries. And a lot of the products that the firm has discovered have been quite successful. Now, these kind of track and trace technologies that this firm is using, okay, is being now used by a lot of different firms, okay? Now these track and trace technologies, what they do is that they collect information at different levels of the repository chains. For example, in the case of M Pedigree, you have inspection data which is uploaded by the inspectors, okay, when they go and test for the drugs, which are bona fide. 
then the consumer data is always gathered through authentication, okay? And this not only helps understand the nature of counterfeiting, the authentication continuously sends information. And this information is generated at different stages of products use, different stages of the year, different regions of the country. So what it does is that it gives you information on times, locations, which is important for epidemiology. So the firm can tell you if there's a spike in cholera medication authentication, indicates a cholera outbreak, for instance, okay? Now, beyond authenticating, it can also tell you where has the product been. So it gives you an idea of supply chain transparency and where is it coming from, okay? And in this course of work, M. Pedigree works with a large number of companies, Zambia, Kenya, and et cetera. Now, a similar, so what, what I found is also that it's very difficult in the field to make a distinction between healthcare companies and non-healthcare companies because there are lots of sort of interdependencies. I'll give you an example of Kiva. We set up a blockchain ID system in Sierra Leone recently. Okay, and uh, this is an article from two months ago. So basically the black blockchain platform is for the financial service industry. It's owned by a US company. It's plugged into by multiple agencies within Sierra Leone, okay? And the Kiva protocol allows those who struggle to get loans to actually be able to prove their credit worthiness to get loans, okay? And it's actually helping people to get microloans. Now these data, um, I'll get to that later, okay? These data repositories, they connect with one another. So the third kind of stuff is these big public mega platforms or public benefit ventures to address SDGs. What these firms do, there are different kinds of firms like this. They filter data gaps between where we are and where we need to go to get to for SDGs uh, implementation. So an example is Atlas AI. This is a California-based company set up by Stanford graduates, which uses satellite data to promote information, or that this is what they say, that they are using satellite data to promote information in the hands of actors in emerging markets in Africa, okay? now. A very interesting thing is a lot of the stuff that Atlas AI does is, is use data which is already available, like household service of the World Bank. Then they combine it with satellite imagery, and they come out with different kinds of sort of uh, predictions. They basically compute what has already happened. They use that to forecast the future, okay? So an example is creation of relative wealth index around cities. They train models that interpret satellite imagery and then train the model to create prediction of asset wealth for the future. This is how it looks for Nigeria. This is how it looks on an Africa-wide scale. This is the information that's available with Atlas AI. It's also available on their website. This is, uh, basically, they do the same kind of stuff for farmers uh, or yields. So this is the information on yield data that Atlas AI has computed for maize uh, crop, okay? Now, what, what, does this, what does this mean when you look at these kinds of different kinds of innovations that are going on? First is that all of these initiatives clearly cater to some local need because there's a lot of need, okay? So they really cater to, so if you want to say, oh, I'm doing something which caters to local need, you'll find a reason to say it caters to your local need. Um, they work and makes almost no regulations in the health sector or agriculture sector or regulations in general. Not many uh, sort of data control agreements exist in most of these uh, firms that I have interviewed or worked with. They do not have data control and enforcement agreements also with the governments, for instance, in Kenya, in Sierra Leone, in Tanzania, and so on. The emphasis of these firms is on trying to use coding and on developing platforms to dissolve some of the boundaries between private and the public, okay? Now, when you interview firms, they use terms like, oh, we are trying to do evolutionary contracting, where we embed what we learn into the code itself so that we can try to prevent, actually, governmental inefficiencies and we can try to prevent lapse in legal regulation. And they talk about benefits for local people, local market creation, implementation of SDGs, and so on. Now. I want to raise three sets of governance issues before I close. The first governance issue that comes up from this kind of work is to look at, you know, what is the paradigm that we're working in and what is the role of the state, okay? Now, if you look at the West and how the debate on AI and big data technologies is going on, there's a lot of excitement and very little oversight in general. Now, and this has been sort of like 
captured in terms like techno-chauvinism or technocentrism, where basically technology is the be all and end all, and technology itself will regulate itself. That is why we have terms like ethics of AI, right? Now, this paradigm promotes corporate control and oversight. Facebook can itself create a committee to monitor itself. Why does the state have to intervene, right? But permeating through the discourse from the West into the working of the digital technology markets in developing countries is exactly this discourse, you know? So what you see is there's a low or no emphasis on comprehensive digital strategies, right? Second is that there is a tendency to interpret that technology has a solution for state shortcomings, which is not the case, but there is this tendency. And there is a misunderstanding of how the state works basically, because a lot of the companies that I interviewed, I said, you know, for whose benefit are these technologies? What are you doing with these technologies? Because you create this data, you give it out for sale. Now, it's not clear who is using this data and for what. You can use it for the benefit of the farmers or for the benefit of the people who have no access to medication, <coughs> but you can use it against them. You can use it to say, you know, this farmer is not credit trustworthy or this person should not get a, a house loan or this person should not qualify for insurance. But the firm seem to think it's the problem of the state to regulate it, it's the problem of the state to provide for it. And there is also a lot of intermediary organizations because firms create this data, they sell it, somebody else is using it, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a new neoliberal approach where technology providers have taken over state functions, more or less. Now. I'm going to skip this slide. This is uh, in line with what Peter Sarov said. This is work from some of my colleagues at Berkman Klein. This is work that sort of makes the point that if you take these AI ethics principles and sort of like you know self self imposed strategies, the link between them and human rights is pretty tenuous. First and second, it's very broad, and these are the sort of um, sort of broad categories they cover, and if you want more information on this report, please get in touch with me, I'm happy to share it. Now the second governance issue is owning the narrative. You know, for, for developing countries, the rush for market creation and data control and fear of data colonialism has created two different approaches. First, you have many countries that focus on data control. These look more like import substituting industrialization. So you have data regimes that focus on e-commerce, data regimes that focus on data localization. Then there are other developing countries that focus on national firms and building digital infrastructure and enabling strategies like national AI development and you know, trying to get IP policies to compete with the US and China. And, you know, and the, here you have the, this, you know, this term public technologist. I, I'm tired of hearing it, but that's what I hear all the time. And I really want to know what is the social accountability of a public technologist? And in both approaches, what you see is the government allowances to manage the data are different for different players because foreign firms somehow get a hold of data anyway. It's the local firms that tend to suffer in the first place, okay? Um, there is a neglect uh, of the fact that local firms can eventually be acquired by the larger firms, which is what's happening across all sectors. So even if you enable local firms, the typical approach to industrialization doesn't work. There is a partial focus on issues like data domicile or data localization, privacy and ethics, which are repeated priorities of the debate we hear in the West. And we don't have a homegrown narrative of this. And finally, to wrap up, what is needed? What forms of legal regimes can help? I think what we really need is a more systematic and comprehensive social benefits approach to AI and big data to prevent the expanding role of MNCs and reproduction of patterns of reliance of the pre-data economy to the post-data economy. What does this really mean? One, we need to focus on balancing access, privacy, and ownership. And two is to look at stewardship and limitations in data. And three is to look at the, the basic framework in which we understand this. So this is my last slide. Can I just quickly go over this and then I'll wrap up? So the policy priorities. First, <coughs> what kinds of innovation are important when we talk about health innovation? Because look, most of the innovations I find are in diagnostics or they're sort of like creating markets where markets don't exist for big firms so that they can go and capitalize on it. The 90-10 gap that we have been fighting for is going to get wider, it is getting wider and nothing is really catering to that. Second is, what are issues of access, privacy, and ownership? Because going from the US and the HIPAA Act, you know, people try to think that you, this should not be owned. There should be no property rights. But 
And agreed, all information about your health is not yours in the way it's collected because they're observed by healthcare providers, diagnostic providers, and so on. But how do you ensure that it's not used against you? This is a very fundamental priority if you want to talk about health innovation for developing countries. Is there and should there be informed consent? And if there is informed consent, why can you, how can you enforce it in English? Because local language is a big barrier, actually, in all the countries that I'm working in to enforce any kind of information about this. And what is the question of alienability versus divisibility, society versus individual, and health versus other users? As in, when do you use health data for good public health, and when do you use health data against the person in the insurance industry or in the home loan industry? And then the question of valuation and compensation. This is a very key issue for policy frameworks. Question of data storage and stewardship. For how long, by whom, where is your data being stored, and until when is it being stored, okay? Then the question of unstewarded and orphan data, because government agencies in developing countries have a lot of data on you already. Now this data can be used and will be used, and it will be leaked. Now what happens to this data about you? Where is it going to go and how is it going to be used and what rights do you have to prevent that kind of leakage? Now, scope of use. What are you creating a market for? For whose benefit are you creating this market? And health versus, you know, what about using your data for the next generation? I'll, you know, for instance, in diabetes or, you know, genetic disorders, you declare it. It can be used against your kids. So where does your data rights end where, until where can you seek protection? and tracking and monitoring, really. So these are some of the issues that I wanted to raise. And um, yeah, I look forward to, to discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Well, having heard about these challenges of the state, now Christiane is going to tell us some of the potential of using national legislation, <laughs> national law. Thank you uh, very much. Um, my name is Christian, can you hear me? My name is Christian Van Veen, uh, and I direct the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project at NYU Law, um, which looks at digital welfare states, which we see as systems of social protection and assistance um, that are increasingly operated by digital technologies and uh, data. And so the aim of my project is um, to look at the implication of these developments for uh, the protection of human rights, uh, especially in relation to benefits and social assistance systems, which is an area that has been uh, widely, widely neglected in, uh, in wider debates about the impact of, uh, of technology so far. Um, I want to thank Sakiko for, uh, for her invitation. Um, she came up to me right before the presentation and said, please not too heavy on the case studies. Uh, there's a tendency to, to look at specifics and not at the bigger uh, picture. And uh, to some extent, I have to disappoint Sakiko because I was going to talk about a case I'm uh, involved in in the Netherlands, but I do promise um, to, to make some more general conclusions after I first explain to you uh, what that system in Holland is uh, about. I also think it's important to start with an example of um, the impact of digital technologies in a particular welfare system because the tendency is, as I think Peter already hinted at, to sort of look at this from a very abstract perspective, talk about AI and rights or AI and fairness, accountability and transparency. And those debates have a tendency to be about everything and nothing. Uh, and I do think it's very important to contextualize uh, uh, for a number of reasons that will become clear, I hope, um, when I talk about this particular uh, system in the Netherlands. Um, it's called the System Risk Indication, and it's abbreviated as Siri, uh, a bit like Apple Siri, but then with a Y in the, in the middle. And that system is currently being challenged in Dutch courts by a large coalition of civil society groups, uh, privacy groups, but also uh, the largest union in the Netherlands. And um, I've cooperated with the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Philip Alston, who spoke here yesterday, uh, on an amicus brief uh, to the District Court in The Hague, who's looking at this, and uh, we focus specifically on the impact of the Siri system on the right to privacy and uh, social security, especially for poorer populations in the Netherlands. And there was a hearing in this case earlier this week, and I'm just back from the Netherlands. 
uh, I attended that hearing. Um, one, I think, important thing to, uh, to notice here for a number of reasons is that Syria is not new at all. It actually started uh, in a way in 2003 when a range of Dutch uh, government authorities decided to uh, cooperate more closely to detect welfare and benefit fraud. Uh, and so uh, social affairs ministry, uh, local municipalities, police authorities, tax authorities decided in 2003 to cooperate more um, 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 in a more focused manner to detect those forms of irregularities. The reason to underline the history of that system is because we now are caught up in sort of uh, uh, an AI moment where we're suddenly, oof, what's this? Uh, we, need to, uh, we need to address it. But Siri, uh, first of all, is not AI. But second of all, that doesn't mean it doesn't have huge implications for individuals. It also doesn't mean that uh, it's also important to, to, to point out, I think, is that there is often not a clear delineation between different sorts of technologies and data used. It's sort of one thing leads to the, leads to the next. Um, and so um, uh, the syst system of Siri was not legislated in 2014, but it started in 2003. And to give you an example of what it was about, um, there was a series of pilot projects called Waterproof, uh, which were operated from 2006 until 2010. And um, what they did in that particular set of pilots was to look at the data of 63,000 individuals who were on um, uh, so-called in Dutch bystand uh, benefits, which is income support for those at the very bottom of the, of the safety net, those who have no other means of income, um, no, uh, no other assets. And what they did is they matched the data of these 63,000 beneficiaries with data by the public water uh, companies in the Netherlands. And why did they do that? They looked at the water usage of these individuals. Uh, they wanted to see if people were uh, falsely claiming uh, that they were living alone while actually they were living together. If you live alone, you get a higher benefit level than when you live jointly. And so they were looking at water usage, uh, particularly to see wh whether someone actually lived at the address which they were claiming to live at, uh, to see if they were not sort of secretly uh, living together. And so what happened is that data was pulled from the 63,000 individuals with, 60, with, uh, with water uh, company uh, data to look at a risk indicator, namely the risk of low uh, water usage, which was seen as an indicator of fraud. Um, and so they had a, a relatively uh, straightforward uh, algorithm sift through that data, and um, the outcome was that uh, about 450 individuals uh, were seen as a higher risk at committing uh, this type of benefit fraud. There was further sifting by actual human beings, uh, which led to a total of 404 suspects. And there was then uh, actual investigation taking place, uh, which eventually led to 42 individuals being um, uh, accused of committing benefit fraud. So of these 63,000 individuals who were screened, there were 42 who were eventually um, um, uh, fined um, uh, for having defrauded the system. That's 0.07% of that pool. Now, what I wanna, the reason I mention this is um, <coughs> not just that to many of us, I think this sort of example seems completely unacceptable for a range of reasons, but the more important point here is that this was completely unregulated. In other words, there was no specific legal basis to undertake this uh, undertake this pilot project and similar pilot projects like it between 2003 and 2014. There was oversight by the Dutch Data Protection Authority, uh, but that oversight was based on Dutch data protection law, which is uh, a general legal regime. Uh, the oversight was quite ad hoc because the Data Protection Authority has only limited uh, resources and, um, and sort of many uh, rights types of concerns were not uh, taken into account by that particular data protection authority. So only in 2014, uh, I think, uh, because the government was fed up with, uh, with constant complaints from the data protection authority, uh, was there a decision made to give um, the system a specific legal uh, basis. So in 2014, a law and a ministerial uh, implementing regulation was passed. And that made it possible basically what was happening before. It was now called Siri, but it allowed a broad range of government authorities at the local level, at the central level, uh, to share uh, the data in their databases, to analyze that data, 
and uh, to identify people at higher risk of particular forms of uh, tax benefit fraud, social security fraud, and uh, labor law violations. The Minister for Social Affairs was the central authority involved in this, and uh, what would happen is for authorities to ask for permission to undertake such a project, and the minister would bring the data together and would analyze it based on uh, a risk model. The minister would then outsource that task to a private agency called the Intelligence Foundation, um, and um, uh, the Intelligence Agency, uh, I'm sorry, and, uh, and that organization would pseudonymize the data and would t undertake the actual analysis, would feedback that information uh, uh, to the minister, the minister would look at it again, and would then um, notify cooperating agencies of individuals who uh, were at specific risk of uh, committing benefit fraud. Now, um, while we went from a situation where there was no legislation at all, uh, at least not specific legislation regulating the use of this uh, uh, welfare fraud detection tool, even um, uh, the legislation in 2014 of this system has many problematic aspects from the perspective of governance, from the perspective of adequately regulating what is going on here um, uh, in terms of the government trying to detect fraud through these technologies and the data that they have. Um, one um, um, uh, first important issue here is that um, you would expect the legislator in this case to have paid attention and to uh, adequately regulate uh, the use of this technology by the government itself. However, uh, they were mostly asleep at the wheel during this process. There was no oral debate about the Siri legislation in Parliament. There were merely a few written questions asked. Uh, to the minister and a recent newspaper article sort of underlined by uh, how, how, how much they were asleep. They called legislators who were involved in 2014 and asked, so why did you vote for this measure? And most of them <laughs> couldn't remember they had been involved in this case at all. Um, a second problem here from the perspective of governance is um, that the current legislation uh, on Siri is so, so overbroad, so vague, that you can hardly uh, uh, call it a form of regulation. Um, the number of government authorities that can join in a Siri project, it's open-ended. The categories of data that can be used, there are 19 of them, they're extremely, uh, extremely broad. Um, there's no standard in the legislation to assess the legality of using Siri in a specific neighborhood or in a specific area of the country. And um, I think the fact that Siri, until date, has been mostly used in poor neighborhoods in big cities uh, is an indication that the law at present doesn't really effectively uh, protect against or restrict the profiling of poor and migrant populations that live in these neighborhoods. And so you open the door to quite blatant forms of, uh, of discrimination. A third problem I see uh, from the perspective of governance of rule of law is that significant parts of uh, this system operate um, in secret or are deliberately hidden from public uh, scrutiny. So the request by uh, authorities to the minister to undertake a Siri project, that request is not made public. The risk model itself, which includes uh, data used, the algorithm and how it functions, the output of that risk model uh, remain a secret. Um, the, um, um, there are many journalists actually who've attempted via freedom of information request to get more information on how the system functioned, and they received the answer that the state could not do that because there was a risk of individuals uh, gaming the system if they would give more, uh, if they would be more transparent. Um, when Siri is used in a specific neighborhood, there's a notification in the official journal. That's also where legislation is published. Obviously, no one reads that, let alone people living in these neighborhoods. And uh, those who are flagged as high risk, so those who are uh, made suspect by the system, they receive no active notification of that fact. Uh, they can inquire with the Minister of Social Affairs whether they are on a list, but again, uh, there's no information whether that sort of request has ever uh, been made. And then a fourth and final um, 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 problem from the, from the perspective of governance is um, I was at that hearing uh, on Tuesday before the district court in The Hague, and uh, most of the questions from the court were, how does this system work exactly? Because they couldn't really uh, deduct that from the, from the law and from the legislative history. And, um, and actually one of the uh, very surprising things was that the state on the one hand and the plaintiffs on the other had completely different views on what it was. And um, 
And one of those elements is that the state claims that this is a purely um, decision tree type algorithm, uh, not machine learning. Uh, yet the plaintiffs in this case uh, disputed that, um, uh, quali that uh, sort of uh, analysis and said there's nothing in the law that stops governments from using new tools in this, uh, in this context. So you see here that this lack of information about Siri and what it is hinders judicial oversight, but also oversight, of course, from media. It hinders public uh, debate. And so effective governance is made uh, virtually impossible. Now to uh, conclude, um, I think that Siri is just a good example of the absence of law and human rights considerations in the governance of technology used by governments, not the private sector. And um, I worked and my project uh, cooperated closely with the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty on a report that he just presented to the General Assembly uh, here in New York on digital welfare states and human rights. And there uh, legions of examples of, uh, of unregulated spaces. We have examples in that report from Kenya, from Australia, from the UK, from Ireland, all cases where there is an absence of a legal basis, um, there is, or there is inadequate legislation, uh, there are uh, big questions of blatant illegalities, and, uh, and, and so I just want to underline that Siri is not an isolated case. And I think to conclude, uh, last thing I'll say is um, you see that there's a, 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 a force driving all of this where governments see a real need to act. They don't want to be left behind in the, in the drive towards new technologies and using them uh, in, in, in government, yet at the same time there's very little awareness it seems that this is much more than a mere technical issue, uh, it's an issue of public, uh, public importance. And as was uh, hinted at before, I think it's also very important that the bigger debate on, on, on new tech and regulation is driven by a very neoliberal paradigm of, um, of letting the market innovate first and, uh, uh, and, and let's regulate later in, uh, in the future when we know uh, more. And I think that's highly, uh, highly problematic given the huge impacts that you see in the Netherlands that these systems can have on, uh, on individuals, especially individuals, whether it's in the West or elsewhere, uh, who are poor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what, what, I, I, what, what I'd like, well, Sorry, I think we'll just give the floor to Thank you very much, uh, Sakiko. I, <clears throat> in trying to prepare for this, uh, for the role as discussion for this session, I was looking uh, until late last night uh, for for something in the folder, uh, and there was nothing. So I, I, uh, so what I did is uh, to prepare a set of notes uh, on 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 a number of issues which we uh, have discussed as well as we have we should have discussed uh, over the course of the last one and a half days. So I'm, what I'm going to say uh, is does not directly uh, refer to 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 what uh, we've just heard, but I think so the, you, you the starting are, point. Uh, maybe I could just. Suggest something. I'm sorry to be uh, intervening in a sort of like ad hoc manner, mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking that given that the, we have so little time left, uh, I was thinking perhaps that um, if your comments, in fact, uh, are not specifically related to what you have heard, but are of a general nature, what 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 I might suggest is that we start the next session. In fact, this is the time we really only have five minutes before the next session is supposed to start. We have a next session in which we could have ample time. Uh, we, we have two speakers, um, Mandeep and Kelly, who were going to give closing remarks, and then we were going to open it up for everybody to give closing remarks. And I think that your comments serve better in the form of this broader conversation, mm -hmm. you know, that draw on uh, this panel and um, uh, all the rest that we have heard, particularly this morning, the panel this morning, so that we can sort of bring all of these elements together. Because I think what we have done in the okay. last um, day and a half is amply document, I mean, just to quote um, Liz, who said, <laughs> there's just so much documentation of the impact of um, new technologies um, 
uh, in widening inequalities and creating new in inequalities, perhaps, and in, you know, uh, in, in challenging uh, human rights um, and taking human rights backwards. Um, and we've heard from um, Peter both <coughs> the effort about efforts to to govern, uh, to regulate uh, in some ways, um, some of these uh, to, to avoid some of these uh, negative uh, effects. Um, but we have all heard from this panel how uh, these efforts are both very. Um, preliminary and uh, incipient in, in their development, <coughs> that both the technical challenges of putting in any kind of regulation, as well as the institutional, social, political challenges, such as the lack of transparency that we just heard from um, Christian, um, that <coughs> makes greater regulation possible the uh, very preliminary nature of discussion about you know these three categories that that um, uh, that Peter mentioned that uh, do you want to ban mm -hmm. do you want to regulate do you want to um, uh, free up uh, all of these issues seem to be very much at the level of preliminary discussion as far as governance is concerned and, and when I think about governance it's it goes beyond uh, just regulating, banning, etc., but it's also a sense of much more strategic approach to uh, being more proactive about promoting technology for health equity, right? So that's another set of issues that relate very much to what we were discussing in the governance panel this morning about how do you create those incentives for the financial capital that is out there to flow to those priorities for uh, health equity as opposed to widening the, uh, the health gaps. So um, if, um, with my excuses to uh, this, uh, the speakers in this panel, um, I would suggest that what we do is to uh, now start the final panel, at which point we could consolidate all of the comments that people might have, questions that people might have um, about, um, uh, you know, what we've learned in the last day and a half, some comments and questions that, that might, they might have about institutional arrangements for uh, governance uh, at the local, uh, national, and transnational levels with respect to systems of finance, incentive systems, the politics, the political priorities, the solidarity you need, all of, all of those things, as well as the, you know, the key problems of the technical challenges that exist. Uh, would that be okay? And uh, I can also imagine that this last session <laughs> might also run out of time, and so I, I, I would, you know, suggest that maybe we would, might go over time by 15 minutes or so, you know, go beyond the uh, 15 minutes. Uh, is, is that okay with everybody? Yeah? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you.